Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here. Another Watchman Pure Bible Study. Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. They worshipped the dragon. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. We talked about how the dragon gives him all of his power, all of his, all of his superpowers. You know, it's just an interesting thought that all of these superheroes we're seeing in movies and in comics and things like that, most of them were not born with superpowers. They got them from someplace. Spider-Man got them from a radioactive, genetically modified Monsanto spider. <clears throat> uh, you know, just different things like that. The dragon gives the beast his power. Uh, they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Two things here that uh, we see in the scriptures. They worship the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and then they worship the beast. You have the, the identification here of the first two parts of an unholy trinity not the Godhead. The Godhead is defined for us in the Scriptures. For those of you who believe such things, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Um, somebody made a comment on my YouTube channel the other day, uh, blasting me for believing this pagan uh, doctrine called the Trinity, when everybody knows the pagans taught that and the Roman Catholic Church picked it up and so on, and I was wrong for believing the Trinity and talking about the Trinity. And I men had mentioned, uh, I, when I talk about it, I don't say Trinity except to say that's what everybody calls it, but the Bible calls it the Godhead. And um, <clears throat> so he's commenting about how there's no proof in the Bible anywhere that God is three persons and so on. So I, I thought, here we go. We're going to see who he is now. So I quoted 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. I kind of knew what he was going to say. So he comes out and he says, that verse wasn't in the Bible, shouldn't be in the Bible, never was in the Bible. It was added a thousand years after the Bible. That's, you know, so that one, and here again, it's another illustration of, I have my mind made up on my doctrine, and when I read a verse in the Bible that contradicts my doctrine, that verse goes. I don't have to believe it, because I think it was added there. Um, and let me just deal with this just for a minute, just as a side note to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this, the dragon and the beast being part of this unholy trinity, the false prophet, I think, would be the third part of it. There's yet a fourth, and her name is, it's a mystery. I don't know what it is. Anyway, this uh, verse, 1 John 5, 7, it's referred to in the scholarly realms as the Johannine common. Johannin, of course, is John. The comma is like a little piece here, okay? And the modern scholars, led by Westcott and Hort from the 1800s, have decided that 1 John 5, 7 should not be in your Bible. So, I don't always do this on the pure Bible study, but I will get our New King James Bible here. <clears throat> which is pretending to be the King James Bible. It's not the King James Bible. Um, and we'll look at how they printed 1 John 5, 7 here. They put it in there. For there are three who bear witness in heaven. That's it's not the same. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Not the same. And these three are one. And there is always a little note down here um, that tells you that the earliest and the best manuscripts um, omit these words. You do not have 1 John <clears throat> chapter 5, verse 7. You'll see that in the NIV where they take it out. You'll see it uh, in all the other modern Bibles. They'll have a little note there 
that says the earliest and best manuscripts. And what they're talking about is they're talking about the this, this Mount Sinai manuscript, the one that Tischendorf found in a trash can in a monastery, monastery where monks are, Catholic. Found it in a monastery. The, 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 the excuse me, the Sinaiticus document, which was probably part of the 50 New Testaments that Constantine ordered Eusebius to print up. Then we have the Vaticanus, which is in the Vatican vaults, which very few people ever get to see the entirety of what the Vaticanus is. And um, then we have the Alexandrinus from Alexander, Egypt. Think about that for a while. Nothing good ever comes out of Egypt. And what you have is three source documents that disagree with each other in the thousands of times. They disagree with the underlying text of the King James thousands and thousands and thousands of times. But because these were older manuscripts in better shape than the tattered ones that were being used by the early church, modern scholarship led by Westcott and Hort have decided that those better manuscripts from around 300 AD actually should be trusted over the tattered manuscripts that were used by the early church. So all the omissions that you see in your New Testament of these false other translations of the Bible, they all stem from the source manuscripts of Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, and I think there's a few others there. I'm not the, the best source on manuscript evidence, but here's what I know. All right? So anyway, here's the truth, and I don't, I don't shy away from the truth. The earliest Greek manuscript that we have anywhere in the world that has 1 John 5, 7 in it, intact, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, goes back to around 1000 A.D. Now, simple math will tell you that that's roughly 910 years after the Apostle John died. He died somewhere around in A.D. 93, 94, somewhere around in there, 96, some people say. Um, and John is the one who would have written that. And from the time John died until 1000 A.D., we, there is no Greek text of, the, of John's writings that have verse 7 in it. And it shows up in a text in A.D. 1000. So the assumption by the West Cotton Hort trained scholars is that, well, the, obviously that was added. That was added. I have a friend of mine who is a scholar scholar. He's a good guy, loves the Bible, loves King James. He actually can read Greek and Hebrew. And I was talking to him about it, and I said, you know, it sounds like John, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word. That's John's language he used in, in the Gospel of John. Bear record. You'll see that all in his writings. And he smiled, and I said, what are you smiling about? He said, I had a professor that said, if it sounds too much like John, it probably wasn't John. And I'm going, that's, that's stupid. Okay? But anyway, um, so admittedly, 1000 AD, we have 1 John 5, 7 just pop up on a manuscript. So the question is, was it added in 1000 AD or somewhere around there? Uh, and it never should have been in there, and never was in the originals. Or was it omitted early on um, by most of the Greek manuscripts, with the exception of a line of manuscripts that ended up being copied in 1000 A.D. with 1 John 5, 7 in it? So was it, well, has it been omitted all along, or... Was it really there in a certain line of manuscripts that show up as you know a copy of them from 1000 A.D.? Um, was it there or was it not there is the simple question. Here we have, uh, we kind of go away from the, the Greek manuscripts of, of the text of the Bible itself. And we look at other sources. 
You have, um, you have pulpit books, because obviously back then, A.D. 100, 200, so on, book binding the way we have now wasn't in place. You had these scrolls or whatever that the, the Bible would have been written on. And so to simplify things, what bishops would do is they would take various uh, texts, various verses, and they would write them out on one single scroll or one piece of paper or whatever, and use that and put that on their pulpit, sort of like what I do here, okay? Um, I put all my scriptures that I'm going to use right here on this piece of paper. And uh, those are called lectionaries. There's also prayer books. There's, uh, there's thousands of other sources of the readings of the original New Testament that give evidence to the fact that the majority text, thus the, the Textus Receptus, which is what the King James was based on, that those readings with all the words that are in the King James, they should be there because you have the, the testimony of all these other um, books and things that were copied and used in churches and so on. You have the writings of what they call the early church fathers. Um, you had the disciples of Christ. Well, each one of those guys were teaching men. Paul taught Timothy. Timothy was sort of the, the son of Paul in the ministry, and Timothy carried on Paul's ministry. And so, undoubtedly, Timothy had access to just about everything that Paul wrote. And Timothy, in bishoping his church, would use what Paul was saying. He probably would write them down in his own manuscripts. Well, you have those going around. You have one particular source, a man by the name of Cyprian. Now, Cyprian was not the greatest theologian in the world has ever seen. Um, I read some things he was, he was totally wrong on and accused of heresy. Okay, so I get it. Uh, but Cyprian, <clears throat> going back to around 300 AD, I don't know the exact dates, but Cyprian was writing one of his little books, and he said in his document, as our dear beloved John has written, something like that, I'm paraphrasing, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. In other words, around the time of 300 AD, somewhere around in there, maybe 350 AD, this man Cyprian had access to 1 John, the manuscript, and he read 1 John 5, 7. Of course, he didn't have the numbers there, but he read, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And he wrote that in his book, and he said, John said it. So we have evidence that that goes all the way back to around the same time that the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus were there that didn't have 1 John 5, 7. We have an early church writer, Cyprian. Again, wasn't a, he was wrong on a lot of things theologically, but he said, 1 John 5, 7, that John wrote it. And so he copied it down in there and he used it. He attributed it to John. So we have evidence that it was in existence some 200 years after John died, it was still in existence, that verse. So it, it's, it's in the Bible. I have complete trust that God put it in there or God wouldn't have it in there. I, that's what I believe. Now, back to <laughs> they worship the dragon. I just thought I'd throw that in there. There's a lot of questions that people have a, a lot of questions that people throw at you thinking, <laughs> I've got them. They don't know the answer, and I can prove they're wrong. <laughs> okay? And you say, well, you know what? I, you know, I've read some things on this. Yeah, it was, it was around, somewhere around 300. You, you can do your own research on it. Cyprian, C-Y-P-R-I-A-N. And um, you can do your own study on it. But the bottom line is, you can say, look, I was told by God that every word of God is pure and that his Bible was incorruptible. So I have to believe that everything in my Bible is the absolute pure word of God. While you're trying to tell me that it was corrupted, my God told me that it's incorruptible. 
So rather than believe you and you're trying to trip me up on things that I really don't know about, I just choose to read the Bible and it tells me that I can believe that everything that's in my Bible came out of the mouth of God. So that's what I believe. It's uh, actually very simple. All right, now we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. They worship the dragon and they worship the beast. I want you to think about this. Here is the omnipotent, almighty God. He is the creator of all things. He is holy, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, which means all-knowing. There is nothing that is higher. He's called the most high God. It's because there's nothing higher than him. Nothing is. And yet man chooses. Let's read Romans. Now I'm surprised I don't have this in my notes, but this is exactly what's going on here. In Romans chapter 1, Paul spelled it out exactly. He told everybody, when you see him worshiping the dragon and the beast, here's why. He says, uh, verse 21 in Romans chapter 1, because that when they, knew, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their, imag in their imaginations. That's that creative side of your brain. Here, whereas the Bible's telling you this is what God is, your creative side is going, I wonder if God is like a giraffe. I wonder if God is like a bull or an ox. So they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Four-footed beast, the beast, seven heads, ten horns, the dragon, fiery flying dragon, fowls of the air. That's what Jesus called Satan when he gave the parable of the seed and the sower. So that's what they did. And because of that, God gave them, all, uh, gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. So here's what's happening here. God at this point, after telling mankind forever, don't worship beasts, don't worship idols, don't worship any other god, Man insists on doing that, so God says, fine, I'm going to give you over. I'm going to give you up. I'm going to turn you over to a reprobate mind. I'm going to sear your conscience with a hot iron. I'm going to put you in a situation where you will never be able to come back from. You are now apostate, and there's no more sacrifice for you. I'm done. It's just like in the days of Noah. God said, it's over with. It's done. So, um, I don't know how much of this uh, we'll be able to go through today, but you'll get the, uh, the gist and the idea of what we're talking about. They're worshiping four-footed beasts. They're worshiping creeping things, serpents. They're worshiping flying things, things with wings and so on. Justin Bieber, um, in, a, in a concert he did, they had him floating down from the heavens, I guess, and he's got these big wings on the back of him. And all of those wings, all the feathers of those wings were made out of musical instruments. Do you know what that is? That's Ezekiel 28. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. And Justin Bieber is worshipped all over this world. So here they are, they're floating down from the heavens. He's got Lucifer wings on him. And these teenage girls are just, and these little sissy boys are just falling all over themselves, worshiping Justin Bieber. Do you see how it works? God gives, God's going to give them over to a reprobate mind because they would rather worship the creation and the creature more than the creator. So God's going to turn them over. Exodus 34, the warning of God, verse 12. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves. You know what their, their groves were? That's when you see these Virgin Marys in these flower gardens. 
That's the grove. Uh, for thou shalt worship no other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous. Did you know that? One of God's names is Jealous. Whew. Is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. I have this little thing that I'm working on that I think that the mark of the beast in the right hand, in the forehead, represents participation in a covenant. Participation in a covenant. Um, anytime you go to buy something significant, like a house or a car, furniture sometimes or whatever, new TV, something like that, you know, pay it on time or whatever, you make a covenant with who you're buying it from. You enter into an agreement, rental agreements and so on. You're, you're making an agreement with someone. You're participating in a covenant. And once you sign your name and they fix their name and their seal, that's it. You're bound by the terms of that covenant because you agreed to it. And the Bible talks about them making a covenant with death and with hell. And that's interesting because in Revelation chapter 6, it's death and hell that comes out uh, when the fourth seal is loosed and that, um, I think it's the black horse, comes out with death and hell followed with him. And so I think here he's warning them, don't make a covenant because that covenant is going to lock you into worshiping and going a whoring, he meant exactly what he said, after other gods. And you're going to walk away from the God whose name is Jealous. I should tell you something right there. God warned them. Deuteronomy 4.15, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves, and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, Baphomet, think of that. The likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl, think of flying dragons that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth, think of Dagon and the Roman Catholic Dagon fish hats. Lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, astrology and the zodiac are not to be worshipped. Some uh, people, friends of our ministry, they said uh, their former pastor got up and taught everybody that Adam and had passed down this secret knowledge all the way to Moses about how the, the true message of God was in the Zodiac. And it started out with the virgin, Virgo, and, which was the first one, and ended with the lion. That was the twelfth one. And what they did was they included the whole story into this image that was half woman and half a lion, the Sphinx. He said that the Sphinx came from the Israelites who had this, this doctrine passed down from Adam all the way to them. And that's what we should follow after. Dun, dun, dun. He said the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, should be driven to worship them mm. and serve them. Because astrology is, well, Virgo is in Leo and Pluto is in whatever. I don't know how that works. Therefore, that's what's going to happen to me today. You're serving the stars. Uh, serve them which the Lord thy God hath divided into all nations under the whole heaven. He warned us, don't do this. It's exactly what they're doing. And, it shall, and by the way, the dragon is a star that falls from heaven. And they worship the dragon. I was going to do this. Think of, all the, think of all the nations and cultures all over the world throughout history that have worshipped either a dragon or a serpent. The, um, there's a pyramid down um, in, I think it's in Mexico, um, Chichen Itza, I think is what it's called. And on the summer solstice, um, the sun, when it hits a, I think it's a certain part of the sky on the summer solstice, J uh, June 21st, it has to be that day, that the shadow coming across one corner of the pyramid reflects over to a stairwell 
that at the bottom of the stairwell, I've used this in, in some Watchmen before, is the head of a serpent or a dragon, and the corner of the pyramid is stepped so that the shadow looks like a serpent that is descending down from heaven to the earth. And that's what they worshipped. The Chinese and Japanese Oriental cultures, they all worship the dragon or the serpent in some form. And so serpent or dragon worship, uh, Indian mystics, they have, the, they have serpent worship. They believe the serpent was the wise creature. The Egyptian pharaohs all had a cobra coming out of their forehead, a mark, their third eye. And so it's everywhere in all cultures there is this serpent worship worshiping the dragon. That religion has always been around and it is going to be the religion of the last days. They're going to worship the dragon, they're going to worship the beast, but they're going to think it's God because that's what God said. You, I'm going to, you're going to worship these things and it's going to call itself God and you're going to believe it. That's the lie that it's going to believe. Um, Deuteronomy 8:19. It shall be if thou do all, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods, and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Simply put, you know how you forget the Lord your God? Quit reading the Bible. That's how you forget. That's how you forget who He really is. The devil's always going to come with a replacement and say, no, this is how, remember, you don't remember this, but this is how God really is. Deuteronomy 11, 16. Take heed to yourselves, again, that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, and that there be no rain, that the land yield not her fruit, unless she perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontless between your eyes, and ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That pretty much covers the entire day, doesn't it? And God's telling them, if you forget my word, you will be driven to serve other gods. That's what's going on, people. All these churches are being driven to serve and worship the dragon and the serpent. Why? They forgot what God said. Um, Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether ye pass this over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth. You know what? God, I love you. First John chapter 5, verse 7. Okay? I... I'm, I'm being dead honest. I did not have this set up. But I know when he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. See, Calvin was wrong. You do have a choice. God said it before you. He said, life and good, death and evil. You choose. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. To thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's three. God is the God of the living and not the God of the dead. Uh, but here's, I like this. He, he, he said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Heaven and earth are two witnesses that record your choice. And the word record or record is here, and we have heaven's record and earth's record. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three, I'm quoting it because I don't have the page turned here yet. 
There we go. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There's your, there's your record in heaven. 1 John 5, 8. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Do you get it? Here's, the, here's what's recorded. Here's what's keeping the record of your choice in heaven and in earth. In heaven, it's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And their record is the same. These three are one. The, in the earth, it's the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Here is heaven and earth bearing record against you this day in what you choose. This is one of the other reasons why I believe 1 John 5, 7 should be in your Bible because it shows you who's bearing record in heaven. If you take that out, you don't know who is bearing record in heaven when the Bible tells you. This, seek ye out the book of the Lord, none shall want her mate. I think this is mated with 1 John 5, 7, and 8. I like it. I like. I just like the Bible. I, I just don't think it's wrong. All right? Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You know who me is? The dragon. The dragon wants to be worshipped. He's a megalomaniac. He wants everybody to regard him as the Most High. He's got this superiority complex. Can't get over You know people like that, don't you? That everybody has to bow down to them when they walk in the room. Everything revolves. When, pe when some people walk in the room, everything then revolves around them. And they, that's how they like it. And woe be to anybody who won't come under their dominion. You know people like that, don't you? And by the way, if you're that person, let God humiliate you so He can humble you. Make you a different person, all right? Because it's the dragon who demands everybody to worship Him. Think about it. If thou wilt fall down and worship me, then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. So those in Revelation 13, direct violation of what Jesus said, what God said many times in the Old Testament. So, John MacArthur, others saying that it's possible you can take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. No, I don't think so. Because uh, those who take the mark worship the dragon. God said you can't do that. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Paul said, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent, the dragon, beguiled thee through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, you know who that is? That's the beast whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, that's Babylon, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear, that's witchcraft, you might well bear with him. Paul warns about the serpent beguiling people so that they worship the wrong Jesus, the beast and the dragon who gave him his power. This is Isaiah 14. We know that Lucifer wants to be worshipped. He wants to be equal with God. Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because he was. I and the Father are one. The dragon wants to be equal with God, but it's robbery for him. So here's what he said. Isaiah 14, 9, Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. Hell's going... Come on, I'm ready for you, Lucifer, because I know you're. I know it's going to happen. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. The noise of thy vials, V-I-O-L-S, you know what that is? Stringed instruments. That was Justin Bieber 
That's what he had in his wings. You go Google that picture. You'll just go, oh, he's Lucifer, I'm telling you, he's worshipped. Um, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou said in the heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So instead of the stars worshipping the one true God, they're worshipping me. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Instead of the congregation worshipping God, they're worshipping the dragon. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wants to be worshipped. Psalm 109, verse 1. Hold not thy peace. And this is, I think, this last verse here. This is the, when they start worshipping the dragon and worshipping the beast. This is God pronouncing his judgment upon the wicked mankind, Jews and Gentiles. He's going to put the dragon and the beast, Satan, over them. Hold not thy peace, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are open against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred. Sound familiar? Has that ever happened to you? Because you decided you were going to stand for this book and the mouth of the wicked... They spoke lies against you. They spoke with a lying tongue. They compassed you about with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love, they are my adversaries. You love this book, and because they're on this side, they're your adversaries. I'm talking about your own family members. But I give myself unto prayer. Boy, think about that, people. Let God have those fights. Let Him have them. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him. And let Satan stand at his right hand. So we have the wicked man and Satan, the dragon, ruling over those evil people who hate you because you love this book and you pray. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. That's contemplative prayer. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. You know who that was spoken of in prophecy? The son of perdition, Judas Iscariot. That's what Peter quoted when they, when they decided that Judas had left his office, God had taken him out of his office, his role, his place among the twelve, and that someone else must take his office, and that lot fell upon Matthias. They worshiped the dragon and they worshiped the beast. And they said, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And, and essentially, God warned them all this time about worshiping other gods. They decided to do it anyway. And so God put a wicked man over them and Satan at his right hand. And this worshiping of the dragon and the beast is God's judgment upon them for falling after the dragon and the beast. It's the, it's the God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And they're, gonna, they're basically going to have their minds seared with a hot iron, think of the iron kingdom, so that all they can do, once now they've made this choice, now choice is taken away. They don't get a choice now. They've already made it. And they don't get to unmake the choice. There's no repentance offered once this takes place. None. I don't see it. I don't see it. They talk about, oh, you know, during this time, people are going to be saved. I know Israel. I know the redeemed of Israel and those who are going to be sealed from the tribes of Israel, the remnant. I know that. I don't know about everybody else. If I were you, I wouldn't wait till. I wouldn't, you know, the Left Behind movie's going to come out here before too long. I don't know what it's all about. I'll probably have to go watch it. Not looking forward to it because I hated the book. I didn't read all of it. It just, I'm just going, this doesn't, doesn't feel right to me. But Tim LaHaye and, and uh, Jenkins telling everybody, oh, after the rapture, oh, yeah. There's all, all kinds of people going to get saved. Basically, it was, it was popularizing the idea that once you saw the saints rise up in the air, 
Now, now you can really start getting serious about God, but don't worry about it until then. Bad, bad, bad theology, bad idea. All right. Hey, thanks for forbearing with me, and I uh, hope you learned something today. Um, if nothing else, the Bible just makes sense. It all connects together. It's all, it's all one big giant book, all right? And even the Old Testament and the New Testament, they're mated together by way of the four Gospels, just like your DNA, all right? God bless you. This is Pastor Mike. We'll see you next time. Adios.